Hey everybody, we are Martin, Robert, and Francis, and this is Snakes and Otters, a pointless discussion of eternal questions. Get ready, we're about to live in your head, rent free. Hey everybody, welcome back to Snakes and Otters. This is going to be episode 20. So I am Martin. And I'm Robert. And I'm Francis. Guys, as we talked about, this is sort of a continuation episode. We're going to pick up a little bit of where we left off when we talked about Wilhelm II in episode 19. And we're going to talk about Frederick III, his father, and I'm calling him the anti-Wilhelm. So, just a little background. We, we touched it a little bit here, but uh, he was married to Queen Victoria's daughter. Mm-hmm. Um, he grows up um, as a Prussian, not a German, but as a Prussian. Right. He is part of their military tradition. But unlike Wilhelm, he sees actual combat in the wars that unite the German Empire. Quite a bit, actually. Yes. Um, So to him, it is not a pomp and circumstance thing. Uh, It is not about wearing uniforms and commanding men in the field. It is something he's been exposed to that means blood and death. He... uh, he is steeped in German liberalism. What does that mean? Because that's a liberal You're conservative, right. very loaded term right. in this day and age. Yes, but it's not that same idea as in the as today's word. It so is, this would be more of a classical liberal. Yes, it is much more. He is the product of of an empire, but he doesn't want it run as an empire. Hmm. And we mentioned again that his wife is also very educated and is is in this tradition as well. Again, she's she's British. Right. She's she's a child of, of Victoria and Albert. She's a Vic, and Albert. It's huge. A, it's huge. Actually yeah. Albert was more the uh, more the liberal than Victoria was. In fact he uh, he's the one that brought a lot of those what you could say Germanic ideas, ironically enough, yeah. into uh, this is the time of Nietzsche and other things like that, yes. uh, the, the the rise of this type of philosophy, where uh, doing right by your people is the thing to do. It's not just because it's good business or that it's practical. It's just this is there's a real moral high ground that this type of what we're calling liberalism. Oh, that's what has a monarch it. ought to do. Actually, you know what? That's actually I think that's a conservative value. A classical conservative value. It, 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 absolutely, it is, and that's why the the terms that we would use today, conservative and liberal, don't really apply to this. Yeah, it, 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 it's hard. It's to, the same word, but it's it has none right, of the baggage yeah. that but modern it's, has it's, with it. It's an idea of there is a moral ground that the human experience has to be built on. That's the eternal it, question, it, it, including the you know including the government has to be built on a moral foundation of some sort. And that's where he is. I don't want to. I don't want to get off on this, but maybe this is something we talk about in a later episode, which I think is probably a good idea. Yeah. So that's darn it. That's two things I got to come up with ideas for. So this whole this whole idea of what it means to be conservative versus liberal philosophically, to me, this sounds much more as a conservative issue, because that moral ground is very much at the heart of the conservative ideals in any sense. Yeah. Whereas the liberal sense is going is almost always going to be you can't tell me what to do with my blank and blank which is you know yeah. today we see you can't tell me what to do with my body you can't tell me what to do with my money yeah it's two sides of the same coin yeah. but uh, that's not what we're talking about but here, that's not though. what yeah. we're talking yes. about in this time period when you talk about the mid 19th century a cons- the conservative term means no changes from the autocracy right. status quo status quo so that, yeah, you're right. Words have meanings, but those meanings change. But his background and his ideas are are very steeped in this idea of the um, there's a moral underpinning to our life. We have to make the government responsible to the people, um, and that's that's the bundle of the question because. His life is substantially shortened by esophageal cancer. And his reign is only 99 days. We referenced this a little bit talking about Wilhelm 
kind of hovering over him, not out of filial devotion. Yeah, not out of devotion, but out of when's my turn to be emperor. So a little disservice to Wilhelm, but that was the previous episode. Yeah, but that's, my opinion. You know, that's his his mother's view on it. But right. they very much wanted to look at having a a different destiny for Germany. So the question they being uh, Vic, Frederick Vic, and Vicky. Yeah. They called him Fritz. Got it. Fritz. Fritz and yeah. Vicky. So Frederick III is hoping for a different destiny for Germany based on these ideas that he shares with his wife. But a 99-day reign makes that impossible. Well, yeah. So the question becomes, is the world's destiny substantially different if Frederick lives? And there are historians that say, yes, substantially different. Without a Wilhelm and without this return to this Prussian militarism, maybe there's no World War I. Maybe there's no World War II. What are the dates we're talking about? I think that's important to frame this discussion. Yes. He uh, dies in 1888. Okay. Okay. So he is, yeah, again, he's emperor for... 99 days in 1888. All right, so we are talking really in the heart of what we would consider the Industrial Revolution time period. That's right. Mm -hmm. So we are, and Germany has barely been a country as opposed to the Germanese, yes. Yes. plural. But at the same time. For more than 20, well, not even 20 years yet. Yeah, at the same time, they are intellectual leaders. Yes, yes. I'm just kind of I'm trying to get uh, you know lay out this time frame. So we are still. Oh, you're doing a great. Yeah, go ahead. Pretty great far thing. away Good from idea. the screw ups, the diplomatic, what we would call screw ups nowadays, uh, that led to the inevitability of World War One. We talked about in the last episode mm -hmm. where all of those interlocking alliances were a mutual suicide pact. Mm -hmm. Those have not yet been established. So yeah, they're in their early days at best. Right. Uh, so. We are looking at something that, you know, even the United States has not even emerged as a world power yet because we've not de defeated Spain yet. That's correct. And the uh, the Triple Entente and the Entente Cordiale, all those alliances that uh, basically sidelined Germany, have not happened yet. And nor are they even conceived of at this point. So this is truly wide open in that sense. Yes, this you're right. It could really be viewed as a tipping point uh -huh. of So you're going back far enough. Nothing's been cemented here to make There's the a chance of okay, France is a republic again. Britain's this constitutional monarchy. Here's this chance of Germany also becoming a very English model constitutional, constitutional republic. republic. Constitutional monarchy type place. Maybe that is enough. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of smack this a little bit, saying that, believe it or not, Germany was pretty darn close to this already, and it still was, even during Wilhelm's time. Because the way the German Empire was set up, basically, the autocracy lies in the kingdom of Prussia. That's the way things worked there. Yeah. It's only the aristocrats, the junkers, and all that to do that rule that. But when Germany becomes an empire in 1871, they set it up really, actually, much more similar to the United States, the way we do things. They were pretty enamored with that system. Mm -hmm. You've got the Reichstag, and then you've got the Bundestag, which is basically the Senate and the House, which have serious power here. Under the Chancellor, which is a Prime Minister type, it's, like, it's a it's a polyglot. It's a mixture of different things like that. Mm -hmm. But the the Reichstag is House of Representatives, where everybody from all all corners of the empire elects people to go there, and they make the laws. But the Bundestag is representatives from the twenty seven member states, that uh, including Prussia. Prussia is only <laughs> one yeah. that go into this. So this was already in place in many ways. Well, but it's this is just, also going to be early enough to where probably none of the precedents that would limit an autocrat have been in place. It's very embryonic. That's so, correct. So this is probably more of a tipping point than you realize because I the system right. was already almost there with just the right guy at the top. You know, as James T. Kirk would say, one man with a vision. But that's the thing. Could Frederick have been that guy at the top? Or... 
what? Because so, Bismarck isn't going away. No. Well, let's well, look at this, it, though. It, in fairness, Bismarck did get his wings clipped as soon as Wilhelm assumed the throne, within two years. So at this point, he, is, he has found himself... He's already he's worried about going out under Frederick. Wilhelm does end up getting him out anyway. So Bismarck is kind of a non-entity at this point. He's going to go out. He would just went out sooner and quicker and perhaps a bit more flamboyantly. But he's not. He's 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 been sidelined. He's not. He's, he's not done going, his job. He's done his job. Uh, he set he set things in place that he will set. But he is not a factor going forward, right, other, than, well, other than poking in the eye occasionally. Well, let's let's think about this. So if the tipping point is basically how much of an autocrat does our national leader become, is is really where we're going with this? Because yeah. mm-hmm. even though we've That's got it. the the particulars of a constitutional system set up, they don't have any experience with it because really almost nobody does at this point except us. And they're not, I mean, other than admiring, you know, a lot of what we have done, you know, we're still pretty young. I I think half of Europe probably was still thought and hoped we would fail. Uh, And, and, you know, those that come from that monarchical background. Mm. So I think the keys, especially if he really is one that is looking at, we need to, to, be more we need to have the people more involved Mm -hmm. uh, either in participation or we need to be responsible leaders uh, because they need to be the focus i think how this tipping point can go largely is going to depend on a couple of things one how the advisors like bismarck are Mm -hmm. going to be able to uh, going to be uh, going to be handled but two how do the people even view it at this Mm -hmm. point i think that's an an essential thing to look at you're, I think you're right on the money because it is thought that their long-term goal, Frederick mm-hmm. and his wife, the long-term goal is to pull out the office of chancellor, which is only responsible to the emperor, mm-hmm. and replace it with a British-style cabinet responsible to the Reichstag, which would have been... The necessary change. Wow, that's that is huge to make it a constitutional monarchy. So it and, would be instead of a chancellor, you would have the prime minister. Yes, it would have. That would have been a transformative thing. And could then, Frederick have pulled that off? And that would have made the emperor basically similar to the way Queen Elizabeth is now. She has certain certain functions. She can dismiss the government. She can call a new for a new government. Things like that. There's certain pieces of oversight. But the day to day, everything is handled by. Well, but Bismarck kind of did that anyway. But it, but no, it was only him, though. There's right, the difference because there's the difference. The office responsible to the emperor, Bismarck's in it, mm-hmm. but the office could have then been turned over to anybody. It could have been turned over to a puppet. It could have been turned over to anybody. Transforming it into something that's responsible to the Reichstag, mm-hmm. then makes it, again, very much like the British Parliament. Or the, well, it becomes it, well, a crucible and the, of a failure gets pushed out and someone else right. replaces so it's, that it's failure. So it's, it's as opposed to the Bundesrat, which was basically all the member states. It's not that at all. It's the actual representatives of the elected representatives of the people. Right. So, right. so you're democratizing it. The prime minister, instead of the chancellor being chosen by the emperor... The emperor can presumably approve or say, no, I, this prime minister is unacceptable. We come back with somebody else. Somebody else. Which in itself can be a constitutional crisis. Yes. But the emperor would have much less input into the day-to-day operations. It's a transformation of the executive. Yes. That's what they wanted. They never accomplished it. And Wilhelm abandoned the idea. Right, because he was that too be, much in love with the pomp and circumstance that right. he saw from his grandfather, and he thought that this worked. He thought, with that, the, if he if he's the right guy, and he thought himself to be, you know, if with the right guy in, in place, anything can happen. And, and the that's the problem with lifelong public offices. Yep, that it, they require the right person, man or woman, doesn't matter. Because once they've got it, you can't get rid of them. That's right. <laughs> I mean, it's damn near impossible. I mean, you know, theoretically, we could impre- uh, uh, impeach than, yeah. a Supreme Court justice. Never going to happen. That's right. Yeah. Just that would be a sacred cow that would just never happen in this country. 
So, yeah. And it's the problem with monarchies in general. They stick around for life. So if you get one who takes the crown very young and lives to be an old person, mm -hmm. it could be a disaster. Or it could be a great thing. That's correct. You know, uh, there's, there's, history has plenty of examples of both of those things happening. Yes. Uh, when, That's one of the things I think makes our system great is that we do have the opportunity. Granted, we don't take a, a advantage of it uh, at the, the, the middle level, Congress and uh, uh, even state legislatures, because once they get in, they tend to be in for a long time. But at least at the presidential level, we have the opportunity to throw the scoundrel out every four years. And at max, we only get them for eight. Mm -hmm. We so, have the, the, the checks and balances build in a system of self-correction that... Or the opportunity for The it. opportunity for that, right. Whereas in the case of the way it ultimately went in Germany, there is none of that. Because the Kaiser did hold a significant amount of power uh, on, on certain things, particularly military power. Yeah. And could devolve it onto the chancellor at will. That's right. Or, and, or take it back at will. That's right. Yes. And, and this is an important part, I or think. Or other individuals like uh, like Wilhelm did during the war. You know, to Ludendorff. To Ludendorff and, and, yeah. and Hindenburg. Yeah, yeah this, is a, this is a great uh, distinction between what it means to have a chancellor versus a prime minister yep. and how that works out. That's because, worth exploring. You got it. You know, and whether or not that in itself is the key to having the entire thing play out differently. Because... You know, in our case, we can vote every four years, uh, or two, four, or six, depending on the office we're talking about. Right. House of Representatives, the President, and the Senate. Two, four, and six. Uh, granted, in a Prime Minister, Cabinet, and Parliament situation, the opportunity to vote comes along a lot less frequently, or can be even more frequently. It depends, because it depends. they're not scheduled. But the point is, though, you do have the people being involved in holding the, those who hold power responsible. So it does bring in that extra factor. It's no longer just because, I mean, let's face it, when you have the emperor and a chancellor, a lot more power resides there than in the other situation. Yeah. And that's the whole point. So I, I think we, I mean, yeah, we, we, we agree here that it's much better, the idea that Frederick had to transform the executive from someone responsible to the autocrat, to someone responsible to the legislature, that's better, obviously. But I think he's, he's it's a it's a visionary thing at this time. Yeah, oh, it yeah. is. It is. Yeah, again, it, it is. He is very different from both his father and then his later his son. Uh, these are these are ideas that could have substantially transformed Europe. I think it's and given the time period we're talking about, he would have another. Assuming World War One were, were to possibly take place at the same time, you're talking about another 26 years to get mm -hmm. this started and cemented. Had and he, he was in his early 50s when he uh, when he passed away, so uh, there's no reason to think that another 20 years was not very doable. Right. Him. So yeah. in 20 years, he could have cemented the the framework. Now, it wouldn't necessarily have cemented the concept in the the mind of the people of the country yet, because that's that's not a long time. And that's to make right, that kind of right. structural change. You, right. You are talking about a transformation of the central idea of government yes. throughout Europe. Yes. Well, then so, that presumes then, if we Britain, do, it, Britain is the only state doing this. Right. Correct. But that presumes then that World War One, if, if, if we want to make World War One not happen, which is kind of our premise here, we have to, in order for this to make any difference at all, we have to presume that the German people would not have wanted either the war itself or perhaps the system of alliances in the face of this. I'm not sure that we can make that leap. Well, I don't, th I don't know that we can make that leap because I don't know that we know enough about the, the people and the time and all the things that went into that. But there's go you make that big a change yeah. to, the, to the structure of how your government is set up. All the players are going to be different. It also maybe assumes that there... Germany is not seen as this alien rival. Right. Perhaps more this like makes Germany more interested in ties to France and Great Britain. What does that do to it? Now that w well, 
What that does that do huge. to the relationship with, with Austria-Hungary, with, uh, with the Austro-Hungarian Empire? Well, I do know that uh, Friedrich, uh, before he passed, when he knew he was going to be passing, one of the things he told Wilhelm, which Wilhelm took as gospel and kept it forever, is that make sure you make friends with Russia. Keep Russia on your side. Be friends with them. Because he knew that if you didn't, you know, hell's coming. And ultimately, that's exactly what Wilhelm tried, but failed at. Russia eventually Russia went on the other side. Uh, if Wilhelm, well, it was if, partially because of the the interlocking treaties. Exactly, that's so, correct. I mean, that was almost. But those treaties could have gone differently, right? And that's that's, that's kind of what we're talking about here. Exactly. Yeah. I don't know that all of those treaties get played out exactly. They they almost certainly can't be played out exactly the same way. I mean, that's definite. I think the thing that is interesting about this is that if you if you bring the people to have a, a, a larger role, even if it's only minor to begin with, uh, because it's going to take a while for everybody to settle into this, how does that affect what comes after? Because I think that's where things get dicey as far as predicting things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I can I can say this though, one Wil, Wilhelm tried over and over and over over again to make alliances with all of the different players. But they were making alliances against him behind their back, behind his back. And next thing you know, oops, Russia's gone. Britain's gone. They're what? They're all together? Well, who's that leave me? Austria? That's the only one I got. That's, I think, if Friedrich were the quintessential diplomat that Wilhelm was not, that he was not easily vilified, he was not considered to be a nut, if they were not afraid of him because of his success, if Friedrich were of a different type, type of person, and we think he is, do the, the alliances come out differently? Because if Friedrich successfully courts, just for example, Russia, and keeps them together with Germany instead of with France and England, now it's another ball game. Well, I think I think r- rapport with Russia is still difficult, but I think you hit on something. If Frederick's successful, which is the big if that we got to talk about still, right. if Frederick is successful in making Germany a mirror state of Britain, then they almost certainly cannot be in conflict. They no. almost certainly cannot be in conflict. I wish they, I could say that, but they were, to, they were too successful. Britain economically envied. They can be rivals, but certainly they cannot come to warfare if there's if if Germany is transformed into a constitutional monarchy responsible to the Reichstag in the same manner that the constitutional monarchy in Britain is responsible to Parliament, they certainly could not come to blows. It goes back to what you said, uh, either in a show prep or in an earlier episode, and that is that democracies don't go to war against one right. another. That, pr- that presumes, like I said earlier, the people of Germany would not want war and yeah. prevent it from... It also back. presumes that the country would see itself as enough of a democracy not to yeah yeah because yeah. i think that because again it's still early yeah. uh, so but, the, the whole keeping kaiser wilhelm keeping his word to the austrians becomes a moot point when he doesn't have the authority anyway it's the reichstag that does right well he may not have given his word that's the whole point yeah of, but, uh, exactly but here, yeah. yeah i mean again to retroactively go back part yeah of. this is the big if and this is where we need to come circle back to because we, we've we've explored what might have happened but the if is, can Friedrich pull this off if he's not sick and dead in 99 days? Historians are split. Yeah. There are some that say, yes, he could have. But there are some that say, this is a, a leap too far. He's not the kind of person who would have stuck to his guns and forced this transformation of Germany. He would have caved to... Bismarck. What do they base that on? And it's a little bit of a. It's like you're saying. It's it's based on the perception from someone else later. Mm-hmm. Wilhelm felt his father weak and ineffectual. Well, and yeah, he's going to see the, that. That was the general feeling of all those in power in Germany at the time. And that's Bismarck that's that's cultivated that. He's, yes. He's definitely and again, created it, Bis- that. Bismarck's doing it to split Wilhelm from his parents. Well, and, and to sideline uh, his father, knowing that he's going to knowing he's going to change everything. Bismarck loses if it changes because he's very much committed to Wilhelm I's yes. method uh, autocracy. Yes. So... 
there's a couple of different things in play here. So for him to be able to do it, well, for him, he would have to live. So Yeah, he has to live. So he has to live. So that means he doesn't have esophageal cancer. Most likely, because yeah. there's no there's no coming back from cancer in the late 19th century. Yeah. So that means he's not sick. Right. So he's not going to be seen as weak. At least in that respect, physically, His, no. Because that's going to come. That's that's like uh, Wilhelm's arm. He's going to be seen differently because of his physical problems. So there's if he's healthy, that. man who saw combat, he may he may. Have been seen as he a strong was, leader. He was very beloved by his people. He was extremely beloved by his people. Mostly, it was the military successes that did that. But he was considered to be brave. Well, success breeds a lot of That's love. That's correct. He, he he was articulate. Uh, he he cared for the people and was very and seen yes. to do so. Yes. Oh, I, I mean, people felt that this was a bad deal that Friedrich died so early. Right. They did. Here, let me give you a couple of pieces here. Uh, this essential question is basically. The same thing that uh, historian Frank Tipton is speculating on. that What happens if Wilhelm I dies sooner or Frederick lives longer? But Wilhelm Mommsen and Arthur Rosenberg oppose the idea that Frederick could have or would have liberalized Germany. He would not have dared to oppose his father in Bismarck to change Germany's course. He was a natural soldier. Yeah. So there... He had seen the blood, so he, he wasn't a, a a puppet soldier like, like Wilhelm. Wilhelm II. Right. He, but he was Prussian. He's not he's not getting out of being Prussian. Uh, he loved the military tradition, and he was too weak and ineffectual a character to have brought about real change. See that's See, what we don't we don't know him well enough. I think uh, we'll have to trust the historian on that. That well, <laughs> to me that's almost like saying trust the economist. Yeah, uh, you know you you bump into a room of them, you're going to get twenty seven different answers, even that's if there's right. only two of them in there. That's right. It's because uh, they're split. There's no question. There's so that's like the, is this wish fulfillment? Is this what we're, is that what those who say it could have changed? Yes, things? I think to agree it's a wish. Maybe I think it's wish fulfillment on both sides. Yeah, because. Both sides are going to form an opinion based on either their pre-existing suppositions, in the case of historians most likely, uh, or those that come up with, oh, wouldn't that be a neat idea, which is kind of us. Yeah, that's so, what we are. you know, we're all going to bring our own pre-existing notions into this because we love the, I mean, let's face it, we love the what if. Absolutely. It, it is the one of the best ways to explore these eternal questions. There you go. Um so, but, you know, without knowing more about true, because they, the quote you read about where he's seen as an ineffectual character, mm -hmm. uh, that's an interesting thing to talk about character, but, you know, it's an historian. Is he ineffectual because he dies not even 100 days into his reign? Or is he ineffectual? I think he said weak and ineffectual, right? Yeah. Weak and ineffectual. Is it that, or is it because he dies because he's sick? Is he weak and ineffectual because he's well, sick? Well, there's one thing here, too. He's crown prince as an adult for many years. Correct. Right. And he never drags his father into... He's never able to influence his father to change any of this. Yeah, he, His father he, loves Bismarck yeah. and wants no changes in the system. Yeah, he's, he's actually ostracized in many ways from his yeah. father. Well... That's not entirely uncommon. I mean, you know, yeah. the, for the son but to it, it, go it, against the, the yeah. father. But it, now, it backs up the historians, though, that do say if he couldn't convince his father to make any changes, he's going to have trouble making changes on his own no matter how long he reigns. Yeah, but that's and, a, I think that's different. And what I, I agree. And, I, I, I got to agree with right. you on that, Robert. I, it's it's you, we, What we're missing here is the fact that we're taking him as he is at this moment without understanding how he will change and grow into the office over, say, the next 20 years, having that time to put in place people who agree with him, believe with him, he supports, and slowly, it will take 20 years. Easily. But all those who, uh, all those Bismarckians who are in place now will slowly be replaced out. And that's where it gets interesting, because are they in place by the time... These alliances are negotiated in the in the nineteen hundreds, early nineteen hundreds. And I think it's unfair to say he's weak and ineffectual because he couldn't change his father's mind. Agreed. 
How many of our children can change our minds? How many? I mean, and then look at who you're talking about. I let my kid have a ponytail. Well, <laughs> that's a personal failing, not, you know, on he your can, part. He convinced me into yeah. it that it can be done. Yeah, well, well some the jury is still out on that well, one. Some, but, you know, there's plenty of influences. Yeah. But the point is, though, you're talking about Wilhelm I, the guy who united the Germanies, who did the equivalent of what we talk about with the Civil War, where the United States are to the United States is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The Germanies, plural, yeah. to Germany. Right. Singular. And, and, and he owed Bismarck everything. Because he's the one that Bismarck or the details happened, so they were of sure. one mind, right? So, but it took strong leaders to do that. That's right, and that's what happened. So, yeah. I don't know that it's fair to say you couldn't change that mind because, damn, that's a that's a tough hill to climb. That concrete was set pretty hard. Yeah, and again, that's why Wilhelm II idolizes him. Yes, because he's decisive. He's a leader. There's no question as yeah. to that. And Wilhelm, Wilhelm throws all of this from Frederick away, every bit of it. Right. Much to his mother's consternation. Yeah. So it's 20 years enough, even. If he lives, yeah, he, maybe he can't push some of this through. But it, will it be cemented enough you in place? You might have it exactly right. I, because even, Wilhelm even eventually, years based on his enough. age, Wilhelm II, he, so instead of taking the throne at 27, he takes it as, at 47. He's still going to be Wilhelm. He's still going to throw every bit of this away. He's not going to... Well, he would grow and change, too. Yeah, you're going to have him growing and changing. Now, whether he grows and changes enough is another question. What you might create is not so much him throwing it away in the way you're thinking, saying, oh, no, I don't like this. We're going back to the old way. Yeah, you'll never make that Because I don't think he would have the ability to do that. It's too far removed. But it would create a constitutional crisis. You might have a German civil war. You might have Germany collapse. You think, oh, I don't know if they did because that. Because, think about it. If if you try and go back, think about if early on, not now you couldn't do it, but an early monarch in England said, you know, I don't like this whole parliament prime minister stuff. I liked it better when, when I had a chancellor. I'm not going to have one named Thomas, mind you, but I'm going to have a chancellor again, and I'm going to wield some more direct power. What would, the, I mean, that would it's cause chaos. It's it's baronial civil war. Right. Well, yeah. It's, because now, it's, it's basically a, that happened. As soon as Cavalier John... Yeah. Well, no. As soon as John reneged on the Magna Carta, they had civil war. Yeah. They had barons versus the king. And, and they had war. civil war many times. They did. They really did. They did. I mean, there's they, about eight English civil wars instead of right. two. Right. So... Are Germans of that type, though? I don't... I, I can I can see there would be a crisis. Well, that's why they were Germanese that's plural. Right. Um, I don't see them... I don't see... I think they would be too attached to the essential... Uh, victories that they had had. I don't see them actually that taking depends. arms. Uh, are they still... This might be a political thing. It might be, it, but are they tough. still Prussians and Bavarians and so on as in the American Civil War where they were Virginians and Marylanders and Ohioans and New Yorkers? I th- uh, well, and part of this is we don't really know, of course, because but Wilhelm was very successful as were his predecessors in Completely Germanizing the, the German identity is key at this point. I think they are. Is it yet? But only with Wilhelm II. He's the only one that. Well, uh, unity is forged in blood. That's correct. But did it happen when the Franco-Prussian War was it set no. there? You think you all think this is more unity? I think it's still in World flux. War One. Yeah, I think it's still in flux. And, and you may be right. You may be because right because for over a thousand years. It was the the Holy Roman Empire, where all of these principalities and bishoprics were, you know, they had a say in, in saying who was emperor. And that emperor was actually fairly limited, too, because they knew that, you know, for one thing, it wasn't a guarantee that their son was going to rule. Yeah. So there's a lot of history where the, the Germanies, plural, think of themselves as that that. Uh, principality first and German second. Because there's nothing new about Germany as an identity. True, but... But it's a plural identity. But it depends on how I don't think, how Prussian the empire truly is. Because I it, don't think it can change that quickly. Because if it can change that quickly to be Prussian, it can change just as quickly to a constitutional monarchy. And maybe right back. Well, fellas, I think we explored this very central question. What happens if... Frederick lives. And I think my... I'm right back at the same place again that I usually am with these things. 
Nothing really different happens. That's, I'm afraid that's where we end up having to go with this. I think the ball is too big to move. The boulder's too big. See, I don't. I don't well, know I that mean, it's too big. You were a touch more optimistic than I was during the discussions, though. Uh, if, if Frederick has the has the diplom- diplomatic acumen, and I don't think he necessarily has to have it personally, but he has to have the ability no, to appoint, has to, have, to yes. have the people under him that do, with this in mind, then maybe if the alliance system comes out differently, then it all changes. That's the linchpin. Right. And I I just think because of the, the time period we're talking about, it's not like we're talking about 1945 Germany, uh, where there is a true unified German identity, or even just after World War I or leading into World War I. They've only been a unified country for 17 years when he takes, uh, takes over as emperor, even if it's only for 99 days. So that's a, that is, I mean, think about that. 17 years in from us declaring our independence, even from the war being over, is the election of Thomas Jefferson from 1783 to 1800. We still hadn't finalized how we were selecting our vice president at the time. Yeah. I mean, that's, matter of fact, one of the catalysts for doing that because... So if, if, I mean, if Friedrich is so it's kind into, of, this, into this uh, morphous piece of uh, environment here... If he sets the tone well enough, you think things could change? I do. Could. But it also depends on the players around him. So you end up at a much more optimistic point, well, really, than I in the am. Sen- yes, in the sense that because, uh, I think this blows it wide open because of the setting. Yeah. Now, if this were, what if, you know, they hadn't gotten rid of Wilhelm at the end of World War One? what happens? You know, uh, there's a lot of different things that happen yeah. there. We've talked about how that could go better or that could go worse in terms of overall. Yeah. I mean, it probably goes a lot better for the Jews. But overall, depending on who gets the bomb first, as we talked about in show prep and what have you, that could be way worse. Yeah. So, I don't know. I think it's possible this could go a lot better uh, as far as not having World War One happen the way it did. Yeah. I mean, there may still have been a European war. Yeah. There may have. Maybe you're just, you're just delaying the inevitable... And like we talked about, if you push it off and there's scientific and exploration of uh, the nuclear question, then things can be infinitely worse. <laughs> it could. And maybe, it was, maybe that's the lesson. Never screw with history. Well, it could always be worse. It could always be worse, yes. But, you know, I think that um, the, it could be better or worse because, you know, Germans could end up on the side of the Allies. It could be it could be truly the first East versus West conflict. It could have been, yeah. I, I don't know. The Soviets versus all the West, kind of. Although that probably wouldn't have lasted very long because they were not terribly good at that point. But <laughs> so, well, guys, we're at we're at we're way almost over. to forty minutes. So that was really good stuff. Um, I mean, I don't I, know that I, we settled anything on yeah, that we one. And I, I don't, I don't, we explored it though. We explored it. And I don't think we can convince each other because again, my my, I'm, I guess being the pessimist of the group more than you guys are. Um, I, I'm still at it. Even if he lives, he might not have the fortitude to push through these changes. And even if he does, can they be cemented enough where Wilhelm can't undo them? Wilhelm's coming to the... Wilhelm the Second's coming to the throne at some point. Right. Presuming nothing happens to him. Nothing happens to him. And he doesn't change and modify. I mean, that's what I'm saying. There's yeah. so many different so many, variables. Because yeah. yeah. this is such a fundamental change. That's right, because yeah. he would be a very different Wilhelm in some fashion. Right. And this is almost... How yeah, 47-year-old Wilhelm's different from 27-year-old Wilhelm. Right. But This is almost like saying Washington doesn't run for president. Yeah. Or doesn't run for a second term. Yeah. There was no way he wasn't running for president. The people wouldn't have let him. I mean, that's how fundamental I think this is. Yeah. And there's just no way to know. And it, like I said, it, does it make it better or worse? Sure is. People, always, people want to think it would make it better. Oh, well, yeah, sure. Of course it would have been better. You wouldn't have had this militaristic state. But, but how much know. can you get away from that given all know. of the other players yeah. around them? It does go back things. to that one thing that uh, Te- Trevor Slattery said so well. It's, hey, hey, hey. It's, complicated. it's complicated. It's complicated. Well, I'm going to take another... A little tiny slurp of this uh, Elijah Craig bourbon, and I think we're going to wrap up. So I think that's a good idea. Maybe. Yeah. 
Thanks for being with us here every week at Snakes and Otters, a pointless discussion of eternal questions. Be sure to spread the word on your social media accounts. Follow us and retweet us. We are on Instagram and on Twitter at Snakes and Otters. Let your friends know that they can find us on Podbean, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, and on YouTube. Just search Snakes and Otters Podcast to find us. And please, remember to leave us your comments and reviews. It helps people find us. And you can always send us an email at snakesandotterspodcast at gmail.com. I'm Martin. I'm Robert. And I'm Francis. Catch us next week. Same snake time, same otter channel. <laughs>